Because future-looking statements are inherently subject to risk and uncertainty, our reminder is that you should make any purchasing decisions or investment decisions based on products that are currently commercially available. Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining this session in which we are going to talk about asynchronous Apex. My name is Alba Rivas and I am a developer evangelist here at Salesforce. Hi, my name is Kevin and I'm a developer evangelist here at Salesforce. Today, our goal is to walk you through the range of asynchronous offerings Apex provides and when you might want to use batch Apex versus Cubables versus Salesforce functions. We're going to start with a review, and in 15 minutes or so when we're done, you'll know which use cases are perfect for asynchronous Apex and which are good for Salesforce functions. Apex is the native server-side language on the platform. We released Apex in 2006, and today there are more than 123 billion Apex transactions happening monthly. A big portion of these transactions are related to integrations, integrations with external systems. Many integrations start on Apex Callout or finish with Apex Web Service. And it is desirable that those integrations are non-blocking. This means that the user can continue working on the page until the callout finishes. We achieve that by making integrations asynchronous. Asynchronous programming has historically been a front-end development topic, but today we have seen it incorporated more and more into server-side code development. So pay attention because during the next few minutes, Kevin and I are going to talk about the newest and coolest Apex features that will help you build amazing integrations easily. Let's do a quick review of the async features that you can use in Apex today. First up is Batch Apex. Batch processes are the king of multi-record processing. They allow you to process data in batches and each batch has its own transaction. This is the secret sauce. This means that each batch has its own set of governor limits and allows you to process large quantities of data, up to 50 million records. And you can do this without hitting the limits because each batch is isolated in its own transaction. If a batch succeeds and a subsequent batch fails, the successful batches will not be rolled back. Batches are a great tool for sequential processing of unrelated data. Batch processes are definitely great. Then we have queueables. Queueables are really, really fast. They are great for operations in which you don't have to process many records, just those a single transaction can handle, and they replace at future methods. Queueables are defined by classes. The class needs to implement the queueable interface and as they are class-based, that means that you can define constructors, set parameters in them, and much more. Most importantly, queueables can be changed together. This means that you can build multi-step asynchronous processes with them very easily. Did you ever want to make a series of API callouts while saving the data between them? That's very easy to do thanks to queueables. This is great info, but example code is worth a thousand words. And that's why we've created Apex Recipes. Apex Recipes is our newest sample app. You can find it here, the sticker URL below, and the recipes are broken down by category. And if we navigate to the async Apex folder, you'll find a few examples. I want to call your attention to the queueable chaining recipes class. That's a mouthful. This class is all about demonstrating how to construct queuable classes and chain them together. There's three things that I want to call out here. First, notice how this class has that implements queuable bit there at the end of the definition. That's the interface you need to implement in order for your class to work as a queuable. Secondly, let's look at that execute method. This method is required by the queuable interface, and it's important because this is the method where you'll put your asynchronous logic. Anything in here is what will be run when the queue will fires. Finally, I want to draw your attention to the last couple of lines in that execute method. 
These two lines demonstrate how you can enqueue another queuable. This is the magic behind chaining queuables together. Each queuable job can enqueue a single subsequent job. This is fantastic, Kevin. And know what? We are not stopping here. We are investing in making async Apex even better. A good example of that are transaction finalizers. Transaction Finalizer's pilot is moving to open beta in Spring 21. And Transaction Finalizer's allow you to attach actions to queuable jobs that will execute when that job finishes, no matter if it succeeded or if it failed. A good use case for them is to design recovery actions, but I better show you a demo of that. Red Goods Insurance is our fictional car insurance company. During normal times, our mechanics use their smartphones to arrive to incident locations. However, that's not always possible, as sometimes policyholders may be in remote locations with very poor GPS coverage. Because of that, Red Goods asked its developers to generate step-by-step -step driving instructions so that mechanics can arrive anywhere. So let's see how they did it. First, they created a trigger on case. The trigger invokes a queueable. The queueable makes an asynchronous callout to Google Maps API. Google Maps calculates the directions, and when those directions are returned back to the queueable, the queueable stores them into a custom field that we have created on the contact object. We also added a finalizer. The finalizer will retry the queueable up to three times in case of failure. Now let's go to VS Code. This is the class for the queueable we attach the finalizer in the execute method. This is the class for the finalizer. It needs to implement the finalizer interface. And then if you want to know if the queueable succeeded or failed, you can use the getResult method on the finalizer context parameter that it's received in the execute method. In this case, what we do is to retry the queueable up to three times in case of failure. Great, so now let's go to our Red Goods app. Here we are in the Red Goods app, and what happened is that Francisco Santos got, was going up a mountain with his car and got a problem, he got stuck, and he called us. He gave us his GPS coordinates, and now I'm going to create a case and see what happens. So what I will do is to select Francisco as the main contact and I will indicate the subject and the description. He got a problem with his car, he's really stuck and the engine does not start. And I will click on save. When I click on save, remember that the case trigger is going to invoke the queuable and the queuable is going to retrieve that information from Google Maps, the directions, and it's going to store that in the custom field that we have created on contact. Here we have them. The directions have been retrieved correctly. In this case, the queuable succeeded. Thus, the finalizer didn't have to retry it. But sometime later, Anna calls with a similar problem. But this time, Anna gave us wrong coordinates. And let's see what happens. I'm going to create a case with Anna, for Anna, sorry. I'm going to indicate uh, the contact, the subject, and the description, and I'm going to click on save. When I click on save, this time, as the coordinates were incorrect, the finalizer, well, the queuable is going to fail, and the finalizer is going to retry it up to three times with no luck. This time, the finalizer couldn't um, recover the error because the error was that just that the coordinates were incorrect. But if the error happened for another reason, for example, a network connection error, we could have recovered from it thanks to the finalizer. Indeed, finalizers can be used for much more. We could have extended our, our retry finalizer to create a task 
so that an agent can call Anna and ask for the correct coordinates. We could have created a login system. We could even have created a promise chain, same as you do in JavaScript. Indeed, I will tell you a secret. A promise pattern is coming to Apex recipes once the uh, finalizers pilot is moving to open beta. That's an amazing example. Cubals and finalizers can help you implement many async use cases. But what if you want to implement a more complex use case? Functions to the rescue. Functions can be invoked from Apex, both synchronously and asynchronously. So let's take a look at how they work. Salesforce Functions is our service for elastic scale, serverless compute. Because they're written in Java and JavaScript, you can utilize third-party libraries for quick productivity. Now y'all might be thinking, I can't wait to get my hands on functions. But functions aren't a good match for all workloads. And we really want to help you shape your understanding of when to use native asynchronous Apex tools, such as Cubables, and when to use functions. So let's examine an extended use case. Alba demonstrated the way that Cubables can call out the third-party systems and integrate data and how those finalizers can then provide a mechanism for retrying failed callouts. While fast, and robust, this solution still suffers from one critical problem, and that is that those directions are stored in Salesforce. If our customers end up needing help where there's no connectivity, Redwood's employees won't be able to access those directions. Thankfully, functions give us an elegant solution to this. Instead of getting the directions and storing them, we can write a function that generates a PDF, including maps and directions, and then stores that PDF back on the record in Salesforce. Employees can then print this PDF at, the, PDF at the office before heading out to an area where there's questionable connectivity. So let me show you how we invoke that Apex function asynchronously. To invoke the function asynchronously, you have to pass a callback to the function.invoke method. This callback needs to implement the functions.function callback interface and to have a handle response method, which is where the result will be processed. Now let's try it out. We'll insert a case, our function will run, and if we navigate to the case, con the case, we'll see that the PDF was created and attached correctly. The differences between these use cases are subtle, so let's tease them out. Both integrate with third-party systems for generating directions. However, one of them also generates a PDF with a map generated from Google Maps. Creating a PDF through Visual Force is possible, but it requires calling a method that acts like a callout and this provides some difficulty as you have to handle DML and callouts in the same transaction. You could probably write a clever, mostly bulk safe trigger to generate PDFs with maps and imagery from a Visual Force page, but you're still gonna have to deal with navigating DML after a callout. Of course, you could also write multiple queueables and chain them together to do it, alternating between DML and callouts, but each org does have a finite number of enqueued jobs each day. What's more important with functions is that there are already libraries for generating PDFs and accessing Google Map directions. You can use those libraries straight away via NPM and implement this use case really quickly. And if you're a Java expert, you can do the same thing with Java libraries. Additionally, functions are elastic. And this means that even though this particular example isn't very resource heavy, functions do not constrain you by resource limits. Functions shift the focus away from governor limits, making this sort of work much easier. They're, now, they're not a replacement for asynchronous Apex, but in addition to it. Why? Because functions trade governor limits for startup time. Once a function is hot, meaning that it's up and running, they're speedy little functions. But once a function's container goes to sleep, you'll have to wait the startup time. In some cases, like this one, it's not likely that we'll need the directions PDF in seconds, so a few minutes warm up and processing time is just fine. On the other hand, getting access to the directions in a custom field, now that would be really nice to have immediately. When you are developing a synchronous Apex, the guidelines on which method to use are clear, but sometimes subtle. If you need to process large amounts of data, use a batch job. If you want to implement asynchronous behavior fast, use a queueable. Remember that part of the power of queueables is that you can chain them together 
to build a process chain. And now you can even attach finalizers to them. Finally, functions are perfect when you want to leverage the power of programming languages as Java and JavaScript, third-party libraries, and of course, Elastic Compute. One last more thing. Remember that we have a new sample app to help you master Apex. This is Apex Recipes. If you want to learn more about Async Apex, we have recipes for you there. If you want to learn more about REST Web Services, we have recipes for you as well. And we are always adding more. To get started with Apex Recipes, check out this quick start that we have created on Trialhead especially for you. And with that, we have arrived to the end of the session. Thank you so much for watching and happy coding.